If not, then I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker, if that's, if that's all right. Um, so uh, Dr. Joe Selby is the Executive Director of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. Um, before he was doing that, he was the Director of research, the Division of Research, I think, um, at Kaiser Permanente Northern California, where I knew him and, and had the joy of working with him in cardiovascular epidemiology studies. Uh, and he's going to come and, and tell us about comparative effectiveness research and how we can work together. Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, I want to thank Eric and Terry and NSGRI and, and all of you for uh, the invitation to be here uh, to introduce you, if you haven't already met us, to a non-federal organization but created by the Affordable Care Act and, and uh, a substantial funder of research, nothing uh, in comparison to NIH, but yet uh, larger than most other non-federal funding agencies. Uh, and the point that I bring to this meeting, this meeting and this audience is that uh, PCORI, for a variety of reasons, sees a very special interest in um, funding research of a certain type um, that is directly related to the concerns you have, that of uh, genetic uh, therapies, genetically directed therapies, and uh, genetically derived uh, diagnostic tests and, and uh, risk prediction markers uh, for uh, several reasons. I'll say also that my being here grew out of a meeting that uh, we had at PCORI, uh, Eric and, and Terry and Jeff Ginsburg visited us in late June, and we decided that I should uh, come and, and tell you a bit about what we're up to. And also, um, they also invited me at that time to a meeting of Ignite, which we um, attended last week, Jeff, and uh, found a lot of enthusiasm there, a lot of, because of the somewhat uh, more clinical end of the spectrum of the, the work that Ignite does, they found a lot in, in, in common with us. Um, Terry, I'm really glad I was here for Terry's talks for two reasons. Number one, I got a much a uh, better understanding of the mission of NHGRI and, and, and of your, um, out, out of necessity in some ways, your uh, tendency to study genomics, genetics in, in the broad view rather than the disease specific view. And, I can and now I understand uh, um, the challenge you face with the other, whatever it is, 30 plus uh, institutes. <laughs> so. Uh, um, and, and I asked myself for a minute whether we really had that much to talk about because I think we pretty much are going to be on the, uh, pretty much on the one disease at a time um, focus. But as I, as I followed through Terry's presentation, she came to a number of, of um, um, items, uh, bullets, that, that I said really would be in Pecori's um, wheelhouse. One thing I'll, I learned was the notion of bed back to bench. Research. I think that's something I say all the time, although I ne didn't have a phrase like that for it. The notion of being interested in coverage with el evidence development, that just to give you a clue, that is right at the center of what we'd love to be funding. Um, uh, and the, um, um, the other bullet that you put up was about um, identifying the outcomes that matter to patients. So because we are the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, we've sort of uh, hitched our wagon to the notion that patients have questions of their own. Um, so today I want to introduce PCORI, uh, define CER, uh, PCORI style, and tell you a bit about PCORI uh, funding mechanisms. I want to um, then elaborate a bit on our interest in supporting comparative effectiveness research in precision medicine. Uh, and, and finally, uh, um, PCORnet got mentioned before, but I want to uh, say a bit more about uh, PCORnet as a piece of uh, the national infrastructure, potentially. So, um, from the Affordable Care Act, our purpose is to assist patients, clinicians, purchasers, and policymakers in making informed health decisions. And we do this through conducting research, uh, through synthesizing research, and through disseminating research uh, findings. So, all three of those activities. But we've come to think of ourselves as the stakeholder-driven Research Institute, um, the, the one that stakeholders that can't get their questions answered elsewhere would turn to. We put a lot of time, effort, and resources into um, engaging with the whole spectrum of researchers from patients right up through payers 
and the research community, policy makers and the research community to get the questions, uh, just as Terry said, to get the questions and identify the outcomes that matter to those groups. We require them to be involved in the studies that get done. Um, and why might I wind up here rather than at some other broadly uh, uh, directed institute at the NIH? Well, um, the, the legislation went on to tell us that our research ought to be designed to look for, for the potential that there are actually differences in how healthcare, in the effectiveness of healthcare, treatments, services, and other items in various subpopulations divine, de, uh, defined by uh, age, race, gender, uh, ethnicity, uh, presence or absence of different comorbidities, and genetic and molecular subtypes. So we are told right in the legislation to pay attention to what we typically call treatment heterogeneity, that something works in some people and doesn't work in others. Uh, our, further, um, think, our further thinking has gone beyond that, which would really be an instance, I think, of bed side back to bench, observing treatment heterogeneity in clinical populations, to helping to identify for individual patients what the best treatment option would be for them. And there, uh, genetic testing and genetically derived therapies um, would be really high on the list of, uh, of uh, items that patients could use information about. And the interesting, one of the interesting things is that we are constrained to funding a type of research called comparative clinical effectiveness research. And so that means we don't typically fund epidemiologic studies, even, even studies that look to define causal relationships. We're not the institute to identify the relationship between genotype and phenotype, for example. Um, we uh, are sort of stuck with the paradigm of comparing two or more options in the area of screening, diagnosis, or treatment um, for outcomes that matter to patients. So the comparisons need to matter to patients, so this has to be something they're currently considering, and the outcomes need to matter to patients. That typically just means we broaden our range of outcomes and, and sometimes we, we cut out some of the intermediate outcomes that, that cost additional money to collect. We go for simpler studies, but in general, we have probably a broader range of outcomes than, uh, than many trials would have. Um, our research needs to be conducted in real-world populations and settings, and uh, as we've already said, it needs to attend uh, to differences in effectiveness and preferences across uh, patient subgroups. One important point, though, is that when we're comparing these two or more options, some people think we actually have to have two different active options, like screening with this test versus screening with that. No, it, it can very clearly, in our view, be screening versus uh, usual care. It could be screening with a genetic test versus uh, the usual clinical prediction uh, algorithm, for example. That would be another one. But it can sometimes be um, screening or diagnosing or treating treating compared to not screening, diagnosing, or treating. So we have three mechanisms right now, and I think this is uh, what we're going to have for the next four or five years. Um, the broad announcements are like R01s at NIH. They're about $500,000 in direct costs a year. They tend to have a limit of three years. We have a little flexibility there. Um, um, any clinical area that an investigator brings to us, as long as they persuade us that it's important to patients, that it is CER, uh, that they've got patients and stakeholders engaged, and that it's likely to change practice, we'll take it up. We've funded about 275 of these studies to date. Um, and these, so these are our most clearly investigator-initiated line of research. The next are targeted. So this is uh, sort of at the other extreme, really where uh, there's a single clinical area, really, with some fairly narrow questions. There may be two or three questions, and we may fund a cluster of three or four studies. Uh, much larger amounts are uh, put on the table. We've put as much as, um, I think, um, right now we've put as much as 30 million, but we are preparing to put as much as 50 million onto the table for a single set of projects. So big funding, and I'll show you the, the targeted funding um, um, questions to date. And then there's something that's a, a bit in the, in the um, in between called the pragmatic clinical studies. So 
In the process of identifying our targeted announcements, we identify other high priority topics that we don't issue targeted announcements on. Rather, we put those topics on a list, and that list is about 25 topics long now, and we issue a pragmatic um, announcement, pragmatic clinical studies announcement every six months, <coughs> and fund um, um, uh, grant awards that are up to about $10 million in direct costs. So they can be large as well. <coughs> this I just want to show you. It's not the ideal slide. I couldn't find the ideal slide this morning. But um, this just shows you our revenue. So uh, our revenues began in 2011. And so the first column, first bars, the green is revenues and the blue is expenditures. <coughs> if, if there's any. OK, well, I'll just keep coughing then. That's all right. Um, um, so you'll see that we have um, taken in about $836 million and committed most of that and just spent about 210 through 2014. 2015, we took in, and oh, thank you so much. Um, we bring in about 400 to $500 million per year. And our spending necessarily lags a bit because the, we can make multi-year commitments, so we don't have to spend every penny we bring in each year. The spending is estimated to peak in, five, in uh, 2017. Uh, and you'll see that um, the money stops coming in right now in 2019. So we aim to have all of that money committed, but there will be a tail of spending out through 2014, uh, 20, 2024, I mean. Uh, but the main message here, I, I wish I could show you the commitments. The commitments is what new monies we'll allocate per year. And over the next several years, it'll be in the range of 300 to $500 million per year, tapering in 2018 and 2019. But enough that it's worth our conversation. Um, this is the way we get to targeted announcements and pragmatic clinical studies. We take stakeholder input. And I want to just say that in the area of genetic testing and genetic therapies, We've had a lot of stakeholder input from patient organizations, from clinical specialties, and from payers, a lot from payers, uh, expressing concern about the, what, what, you know, the um, submerged part of the iceberg that they're expecting to run into shortly. We screen them to make sure these questions really are CER and they're not already answered or not already funded in, to a substantial degree by others. We put them on a list um, and we take them to our board. Um, the board. Uh, can approve them for the development of the board is the uh, scientific oversight committee of the board. And they can approve them for um, um, uh, development of topic briefs. We bring them back to the SOC. They uh, uh, approve them for advancement to the advisory panel. We have multi-stakeholder advisory panels with everybody from page, patients to payers, a number of researchers, clinical specialists, etc. And they prioritize them. We take that prioritized list back once more to the SOC, and they approve uh, the refinement. And, and uh, right now, um, we are here. So we've been through the advisory panels. We are in the process of refining um, precision med med medicine topics right now. So we are essentially poised to make a large funding announcement. But I will admit that we are still looking for some really good ideas. now. I may have come to the wrong place, uh, just in that uh, you're not disease specific. And I think a lot of these will probably be smaller disease specific studies. But um, some of the things Terry um, mentioned, like, for example, whole genome sequencing versus more targeted uh, sequencing makes sense. So um, that's how, how we um, prioritize topics. And precision medicine has done very well. I think I've already told you about the pragmatic studies. Two cycles a year, six to nine awards per cycle, up to $90 million per cycle or $10 million per study, uh, five years duration typically, uh, and uh, the maximum direct cost per project, uh, $10 million. The only thing, the only other thing we really emphasize is that um, these researchers need to work closely with major stakeholder organizations as they're doing the study because we want it to be actually understood, agreed in advance that the study is being done well, it's the right question. So that when the results are um, available, uh, we will have partners to help disseminate the findings. These are the targeted awards. And um, I'll, I won't read them all, but I'll just let you, you see that in the later ones, the hepatitis C, the novel or oral anticoagulants, treatment-resistant depression, we're getting more and more specific. Uh, 
and the questions are getting tighter. The first ones are uh, like um, um, treatment options for African Americans and Hispanic Latinos with uncontrolled asthma was a, was a much broader kind of an announcement. But I want to draw your attention to a central message here, and that is that um, two of them with the uh, double stars, that is the multifactorial fall injury prevention strategy in older persons, it's called STRIDE, and the Hypertension Disparities Reduction Awards in African American and Rural Populations were, um, are co-administered by, with an institute of NIH. NIA for the falls in the elderly, NHLBI, and, and NINDS for the um, uh, Hypertension Disparities Reduction Awards. We have had um, great success. Oh. Okay? Um, we have had great success uh, in these two collaborative studies uh, with uh, the NIH. We also showed one there um, with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. But in the STRIDE study, the prevention of falls in the elderly, PCORI put $30 million into this, and a five-year award was made in uh, early 2014 for $30 million to a multi-center um, um, consortium. Uh, and they put together a multi-site cluster randomized clinical trial, complete with a one-year pilot stage. The pilot has been completed, uh, and the main trial is now underway. Now, what NIA brought to this initially was expertise, uh, both in the, in the literature of, the, of falls prevention, but also in mounting large-scale uh, interventional trials like this. So they ran it. They solicited the research and ran it, but we participate with them in every aspect of it uh, and, and sit on the steering committee of the study. Really a wonderful collaboration. The other one with the heart, lung, and blood and NINDS we think is going equally well. So the message here is that we are very interested in, we see the value of um, a collaboration with other funding agencies, particularly with uh, institutes here. So that hopefully will come up a bit in the discussion, but uh, I think it, uh, when Eric heard it, he was interested, and uh, um, uh, we'd love to discuss that further. Um, so uh, a bit about our view of precision medicine, that, that the products of precision medicine in our uh, probably naive view include uh, uh, new therapies uh, based on discovery of uh, the impact of acquired, inherited or acquired genetic variation in disease susceptibility and also on markers for predicting these disease, resi disease risk or treatment response that can help guide treatment choices. But we also uh, certainly adhere to the notion that precision medicine has to include things other than genetic factors um, uh, such as age and life expectancy, gender, socioeconomic status, literacy, comorbid conditions, and also this curious notion of patient preferences that really to get down to what works best for individuals, one needs to be able to uh, factor in patient preferences as well. So this is um, my notion of um, uh, bedside back to um, bench and the uh, complementarity of uh, CER and precision medicine. So on the left is basic science, early clinical uh, uh, development and testing and, and, and maybe phase three trials even for the medications. And at a certain point, it comes into the real world of clinical care and uh, it may be in the form of, of uh, genetic tests or targeted medications. Uh, and uh, then comparative effectiveness uh, comes into play. Uh, comparative effectiveness can evaluate um, uh, both genetic markers, and um, it can also uh, evaluate the effectiveness of new therapies. But in addition, if you do comparative effectiveness the way we prescribe with attention to treatment heterogeneity, it may identify some of those clues that lead one back to the laboratory. So our role would be uh, rather limited in some ways um, that most new diagnostics and new targeted therapies ought to ultimately prove their value to patients uh, compared with current practices. I paused for a minute when I saw the, uh, the, uh, the marker for Stevens-Johnson syndrome that 44 of 44 people had the uh, allele and I said, would I really stick to my guns that we needed a, uh, an effectiveness trial there? And I think I wouldn't, but we know that most genetic tests don't pan out quite to be the, quite that predictive. Um, but comparative effectiveness research is typically needed uh, when new ther uh, therapies uh, appear and propose to replace current standards. 
the benefits uh, may differ from uh, what was done pre-approval. Uh, the adverse effects may have been too rare or distant in time to be detected pre-approval. And um, ongoing efforts are needed to identify those patient subgroups who do benefit, those who don't. Um, uh, and predictive ability is also not the same as effectiveness. I sometimes run into people that don't buy into this, and my caveat about Stevens-Johnson syndrome holds here. But inaccurate prediction can certainly cause harm, and the utility of the new test might need to be compared with current prediction tools. Although I did, at the IGNITE meeting, you'll be pleased to know that I was corrected. I suggested that sometimes clinical prediction rules uh, are just as good, or that genetic tests don't add anything to clinical prediction rules. And somebody pointed out to me that that might not be quite the right question, that if the genetic test was simpler to administer than a complex clinical prediction rule, you might, I might have asked the wrong question or used the wrong gold standard in evaluating the new genetic test. So I, 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 I learned from that uh, exchange. We've conducted a landscape about whether, um, uh, a landscape review about whether uh, it's time for comparative effectiveness research in precision medicine. Uh, we started with uh, in, uh, engaging Catherine Phillips from UCSF um, and, and an assistant, Noah Mason at, at Bacori, and they did structured in interviews with nine precision medicine experts. I don't know, somebody in this room might have been interviewed. I, I, I don't have the list of interviewees here. Um, questions like, should PCORI move forward with precision medicine, an initiative? What's your rationale for go having us to go forward, et cetera? And I want to show you some of the findings from that. Should we move forward? Um, almost unanimous agreement that it's time that we ought to move forward. Uh, the rationale was that clinicians are starting to use precision medicine now. Little is known about whether, um, wh whether or which precision medicine approach uh, is best and how much precision medicine contribute over and above conventional approaches. So that was what the um, um, interviewee said. Uh, what approach should we uh, take? It should, we should do a scoping review and uh, limited outreach to stakeholders, avoid systematic reviews and other time-intensive time uh, activities, get on with it. Um, issue a relatively targeted uh, funding announcement. We call ours, uh, uh, our, no, this is as usual. We usually call ours PFAs, but in, uh, issue a relatively large targeted funding announcement, not completely open. Uh, although there was not much consensus about what the studies were that we should pursue. Um, which types of studies? A slim majority favored CER study of specific interventions. There was some support for infrastructure development and quite a bit of support for um, uh, studies of supporting patient decision making about these. Uh, little support for method studies in this area, um, and little agreement on the specific topics. Um, one, top, one person's top priority appeared to be another's lowest. Uh, some did uh, some support for concentrating on chronic conditions other than cancer, on population screening, uh, cancer got back in, uh, pharmacogenetics, and infectious diseases. Um, we were advised to stay engaged closely with NIH's, uh, with the Precision Medicine Initiative, but pursue our own agenda. Um, and so that's uh, just um, trying to convey the notion that we are um, um, working hard to get to the point where we have a Precision Medicine Initiative that we feel could be complementary to work that you do and uh, complementary to the work of the Precision Medicine Initiative as it comes out. I look forward to your comments. A few words in closing on PCORnet which is a very large investment. It's now uh, made by PCORI to the tune of um, over $260 million over the last, uh, beginning about two years ago now and uh, extending three years into the future. We started with 11 clinical data research networks. We're now up to 13. The principal investigator of one of those 11 clinical data research networks uh, is uh, here, Lucilla Ono Machado, uh, heads um, the CDRN, called P-Scanner, which brings in the uh, five, UC, uh, five of the UC, University of California Medical Center Systems, the VA, and a number of community partners as well. Uh, clinical data research networks, by definition, draw data from electronic health records and other sources on at least a million persons. Most of them, including uh, P-Scanner, go well above uh, a million. Uh, Vanderbilt is also a key player, uh, now in partnership with Duke and uh, a very large uh, community-based uh, healthcare delivery system, the Mayo Clinic, Kaiser Permanente, a very large federal, uh, federally qualified 
Health Centers Network, the City of New York, all the academic medical centers in New York are banded together. The City of Chicago, all the academic centers in Chicago are banded together. Um, data has now been um, standardized, uh, uh, at least put into a standard data model on more than 70 million persons. Uh, the key currency at this point is the electronic health record data, and we're working hard to bring in claims and patient-reported uh, information as well. Also in PCORnet are now 21, now 20 patient-powered research networks, groups of patients with single conditions, half of them rare conditions, half of them common conditions. Um, their job is to in, in, uh, insert um, a strong focus on patients and the patient perspective in everything that PCORnet does. And our job is also to grow and to partner within the CDRN so that we build larger and larger communities of research-ready patients with single conditions. Um, and a coordinating center which, um, which supports these networks, works hard at standardizing the data, and provides the logistical assist assistance for the meetings. Uh, the goals of PCORnet are, are um, distinct. On the one hand, it's to um, improve the nation's capacity to conduct large-scale clinical research more efficiently. Um, both randomized trials and large observational studies are um, on, the, on the docket, and this is one of the few networks that aims to be able to do both. Uh, and at the same time, to support a learning U.S. healthcare system, to support the use of that data right in the healthcare delivery systems from which the data is coming. So with the patients, the clinicians, the delivery system leaders, and payers as well involved, uh, really bend the, the data and the system and the network toward answering questions about uh, the efficiencies of healthcare delivery. So a very ambitious uh, set of goals. Um, we're linked closely with Sentinel, which is an FDA and, uh, uh, supported um, insurance claims based network. So um, we have the same coordinating center, uh, we have overlapping populations, and we are working closely with Sentinel to try uh, an efficient way of bringing claims data to the table. And we also work very closely with the CTSAs because we share an interest in being able to do uh, clinical trials and to use electronic health record data within academic medical centers. Uh, that that um, triumvirate, I think, is really essential to making sure that we have one national, large-scale, um, um, population-based um, network rather than three. And I think the leadership of all three is very committed to try to make that a reality. Having put all of this together, we really see ourselves as good partners for a wide range of registries uh, because there will be overlap of any registry with this very large population-based set of data. Um, PCORnet, Sentinel and CTSAs together, would bring the electronic health record data the registries, though, may bring more patient-reported data. Um, this is our operational structure. In the middle are the networks. Uh, over at the left is the rest of the steering committee, which includes uh, the networks, of course, but it also includes a patient council. It in includes uh, funding agencies, the NIH, FDA, our CDC, are all represented there. Josie Briggs from, uh, let's see, I'm not going to remember the acronym uh, that NCAM now has, but Josie Briggs. I'm sure you all know, uh, represents NIH. Um, we also include CMS, the Office of the National Coordinator, and ASPE because they uh, control access to a large amount of data. That's crucial. Uh, representatives of medical product and device manufacturers uh, are uh, on the steering committee, as is uh, PCORI itself and the coordinating center. Um, on the right are task forces, and this is a little outdated. We're doing things a bit differently now, but we do have um, a number of the CDRNs and a couple of the PPRNs have biorepositories. Um, we have not put a lot of effort or tied out a lot of time to put a lot of effort yet into uh, assessing these, but there's a lot of interest within PCORnet, obviously within CTSAs as well, in harnessing biorepositories and being able to link our repository data with electronic health record data and claims data. Also, a lot of work going in in partnership with CTSAs on data privacy issues and on uh, IRB oversight. These are crucial areas, and I heard Terry uh, mention that as well. So in closing, and uh, this is the over to you slide, uh, we do have a natural interest in studying the products of precision medicine, and we think it is a virtuous cycle that we'd have something to offer to uh, precision medicine as well. 
um, that PCORI is very interested in collaborations with other funding agencies, uh, particularly when that collaborative partner brings specialized expertise in a content area, as in HGRI most certainly would. And uh, PCORnet and similar population-based EMR-driven networks with strong patient involvement in governance are uh, promising and exciting places uh, to do the kinds of research that, that interest in HGRI. So I thank you and uh, would hope that there are some comments, advice, corrections, suggestions, questions. In moderate, if you. I think I see a question. Yes. So uh, I understand that PCORI is not supposed to ultimately consider cost. Do you monitor cost in the study? We tend to monitor resource utilization and not costs. Um, costs are a very difficult thing to get in any objective way out of a, a delivery system. They mo some delivery systems have a database that has costs in it, but what those costs mean and how that compares to costs in another setting uh, are almost, um, pre they're predictably inconsistent in, in, in extreme ways. So if one collects all the resources that are used and maybe adds to that an assessment of patients for their out-of-pocket expenses, you can then apply standard costs and really compare the total consequences of a treatment decision in one system versus another. So um, for, for a variety of reasons, we don't measure costs. But one, the biggest one really, honestly, is that the data are not particularly useful. But you monitor resource utilization. But we definitely monitor resource utilization. In theory, one could back out cost. Utilization. Well, uh, that's what we recommend, that in fact, you, uh, you standardize, you apply standard costs so that you can uh, really, uh, you know, so that you really have a meaningful comparison between how things are done at UC San Diego and how things are done in Kaiser Permanente. I can tell you that Kaiser Permanente's cost database, it, you know, from, thir from 27 years there, it really doesn't mean anything in terms of that you'd be interested in knowing. It doesn't mean anything about what they really cost. We had initially, and I'm not sure the message got to, to Dan and, and Bob, we thought maybe you guys might want to be commenting on this, so I might ask you to comment when you have a chance. Um, but I might also ask while you're thinking of that, um, one of the, the major cultural uh, icons of, of NHGRI is data sharing, and so we're, we're very strongly into that. And I was just curious um, what approach you guys use to, to data sharing. So we are, um, in, in fact, working with that at the board level. Now, so not just about PCORnet, but about PCORI-funded studies in general. We want to have a, we want to position ourselves near the front, near the front of the open science movement in general, you know. We also are a small agency, uh, which is good in some ways. We don't have tens of thousands of awards like the NIH has, so we don't have to go back and talk to tens of thousands of awardees or, or break the news to a thousand per cycle. Um, but, um, you know, we, we want to do it in step with other agencies, but we will, we are working on it now. We will have an open science policy and it very definitely will have data sharing as an expectation. Not always brought to fruition, you know, it will be basically data sharing if uh, data are requested. Uh, we, we couldn't afford to capture and store uh, all the data from every study but we want uh, people to be prepared and we will provide some resources for uh, awardees to uh, prepare their data for sharing, which means get the protocols ready. We, we really actually do want uh, to, I'm quite sure part of our policy will involve making protocols publicly available uh, and then um, sharing the data upon request and, and in selected studies. And that will then, uh, PCORnet is also uh, working on its policy, but it will be consistent with Pecori's. Lucilla. Well, uh, perhaps is new, maybe it's why you didn't mention the targeted sequencing um, effectiveness uh, trial from UCSF, from breast cancer. I think that's one that most relates to this group. 
why would you would you like to um, describe it or you want me to? You might do a better job than I. Um, well, uh, essentially, they are comparing targeted sequencing uh, the value on outcome. So they have a, a control trial. They're, okay, so so I'll jump in now. They're they're comparing targeted sequencing as as one piece of evidence to calculate a woman's risk for breast cancer to guide the decision about how often to have mammography. So this is a 55,000 person randomized trial. One arm gets a recommendation from their delivery system to have mammography every year from the age of 40 to 74, 75. The other arm gets talked to and counseled about their risk and uh, gets the genetic test, the targeted uh, sequencing tests, and gets an assessment of their preferences, and then they make their decision. So it's really like taking the US Preventive Services uh, Task Force recommendation and putting it into the test, which, you, which says talk to your doctor, assess your risk and your preferences, and decide whether you're going to get screened. That's what they do. And um, um, uh, the outcomes are incidence of advanced disease and ultimately mortality from breast cancer. So it's a very exciting study. And thank you for, for uh, mentioning it. And is that only BRCA1 and 2 testing, or are they doing panels? I think it's more than BRC1 and 2. I, Lucilla, you may know that. Yeah, and it's actually, it's, it's an extensive panel. Great. Sequencing. Yeah, and that's other already underway or being It's planned? just getting started. It, Laura Esserman at the sure. Cancer Center at UCSF is the yeah. principal investigator. Excellent. So uh, the, the um, one of the questions that always comes up, at least in my mind, is, is what is it that PCORI is funding? So are you funding the sequencing, for example, in that particular, is that part of the budget or is, is the sequencing viewed as, I've always been, I've been under the impression, perhaps mistakenly, that, that what you're particularly interested in the comparative effectiveness research domain are, are, are comparing two reasonable treatment strategies, both of which are sort of out there and Covered. available for, for, for physicians to use, and so you sort of help us figure out which is the right one. But is the sequencing, for example, being paid for by PCORI, or is that being paid for by carriers? And, and that, because that's an important question. I am question almost for the first sure that that's being paid for uh, outside of PCORI. Uh, I'm almost certain of it. And we may, but we may actually be, for example, talking with CMS about their covering it. Uh, we have another study of, um, uh, didn't have anything to do with genetics particularly, but of proton beam therapy, a very expensive treatment for breast cancer, and we're talking with CMS and, and insurers about covering uh, its use in a clinical trial. I mean, one of the... And so in general, but, but you're pointing to a in, really interesting um, um, dilemma that PCORI faces. Um, you'd think that perhaps we really are studying only two approved treatments, both of which are already covered by... Uh, um, insurers. But that really doesn't answer many of the most burning questions. And we're really driven and we're pushed towards questions. Uh, hepatitis C was a big area. Um, so um, we, we need some post-marketing outcome studies of hepatitis C, both uh, one drug versus another and also screening versus watchful waiting or testing, uh, treating versus watchful waiting. So we are pushed towards a type of comparative effectiveness research, which really is effectiveness, it's the real world, but it's not necessarily two treatments, both of which are already standard practice. I mean, if I can, if, if I can give you some sort of free advice that you can take or leave, one of, the, one of the barriers that we identify in the genomic medicine working group is this, is this issue of who's gonna pay for all this at the end of the day, and, and the fallback position often is, well, if we could figure out a way of at least getting the the trial funded through CMS, and there was a period, for example, when warfarin testing would be paid for if you were part of a study and not if you're not part of a study. So it seems to me that you yes. have the opportunity to, to help us uh, figure out what's going to be effective and not by negotiating with CMS or other payers to, uh, to help us uh, compare two, effect, two, tre two treatments. It also, that's one comment, take it or leave it. The other, the other uh, question I had was in that breast cancer study, what's usual treatment? What's the usual care arm? Yeah, is there a usual care the arm? Usual care arm like like the usual care arm is the recommendation to have annual. No, I think they... Annual? Annual, yes. And um, 
the the um, that's not. You know, I think that because they're because they're and and I'm not familiar with it enough to tell you the ins and outs, but but my suspicion has been that their fear was that um, if they did it every two years uh, and they showed no difference, somebody would say, yes, but certain women should have it every year. And so, uh, other comments? Oh, Val. Uh, maybe I misunderstood, didn't quite get this, but uh, you mentioned as a potential barrier with uh, collaboration with NHGRI is the fact that uh, you usually focus on single dis disorders. Well, we 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 typically focus on uh, clinical questions, and clinical questions often express themselves uh, in the form of um, you know an endocrinologist asks about a question in patients with diabetes, etc., oncologist, etc. Um, yeah. Well, I, well, I just wondered there what the kind of the definition of a single disease was in light of. Uh, the genetic heterogeneity of most most disorders, <laughs> and and that would seem to be a great area where NHGRI and uh, Picori could uh, interact. Well, I, I mean, I'm persuaded, and I want to, and I want to be persuaded, and I am that there that there are areas um, uh, where we could find uh, overlap of interests um, uh, beyond yes. just single disease studies or single heterogeneous disease studies. And then the other thing, in, in my experience of, of writing grants to different uh, NIH institutes, is one thing that they don't seem to like to pay for very much, at least in my experience, is, is uh, phenotyping of, of patients in different cohorts. And I wondered if, uh, if Corey has interest in that, which would greatly help some of the genetic uh, heterogeneity issues and how they relate to the well, medical care. And it, it is a good question. I don't have a, a, um, an answer for it that's very different than the previous one, which is that typically we tend not to pay for diagnostic tests, et cetera, um, if it's, particularly if it's part of a clinical um, a, a treatment algorithm or a diagnosis workup. But, um, you know, I would not say never because sometimes it, it may be just essential uh, and it's just very clear that we're not going to be able to um, get it funded otherwise. I mean, we've tended to say if this is close enough to clinical, to being out there and used in clinical practice, even if it's not covered, delivery systems or, or payers ought to be willing to cover it in a study. Uh, because it's very soon going to be, and then it'll be too late. Um, but you know, there may, they may, and we could actually explore particular um, um, questions where that might be a part of the question. Could, could we? And we'd have to, we'd have to work with you on it. Yeah, I think what, you know the point that you raised, Val, about about, and, and that you did as, as well, Joe, about disease specificity. I mean, we struggle with that around this table. When, whenever we try to get into into a clinical paradigm, it's almost always for specific disease. There there is very little that clinicians do that is general health. You know? um, and so, uh, you know, maybe newborn screening is the is the one example. You know, the one exception there. But uh, but it is a big challenge. So um, I've been looking at your uh, the PCORI website, and there's a task force on biorepositories. And so I'm wondering about the biorepository work that's going on within PCORI. Is that just for in-network that's, groups? It, that's a that's a PCORNet task force. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it's um, headquartered at Duke. Um, and as I said, it's been fairly quiet, but I think it's going to pick up rather abruptly uh, in the next few months. And those right. samples then would not be accessible to outside researchers? Uh, at this point, the answer is, is no. I think PCORNET is, uh, because we did not pay for the collection of those samples, so we don't have any leverage over them. You know, we're, we're hoping that kind of the funding of PCORNET can enable researchers at an institution uh, that has a res uh, repository to make better use of their repository's data. Uh, 
for PCORnet overall, we really do have an aim that PCORnet will be open to outside researchers. Uh, now, the, I, I think the, even then though, the biorepository part of it, since we didn't pay for it, is, is going to have to be a, a negotiated ar arrangement. Uh, we certainly do hope though that, that PCORnet as a, as a research resource is used um, not only by people in the 50 or 60 institutions that are part of PCORnet, but, um, but in, um, you know, by the broader research community. So, I mean, that's part of what we're putting the investment in for. So, I mean, as I, as I listen to this and think about it some more, and of course, we, we, you know, we have a PCORnet center, so I hear about vaguely about, about that at our place. The, it seems to me that what your, what your major focus is, is to answer single important pressing questions for practice. So, is it better to do this or that? This or that. Colonoscopy versus occult blood screening, or falls this way or falls that way. And it also seems to me, as I look at Terry, that some of what we're doing in the genomic medicine space is getting pretty close to you. And so the opportunity is to engage some large uh, collection like you have, like you've harnessed to, and it's up to us, I guess, to identify those important questions. And we can put that on the table for our genomic medicine working group and come up with the three or four really pressing large-scale questions in genomic medicine that we could then get you to answer for us. I didn't say it that way. <laughs> get the idea. Or together. We'll answer them together. Right, right, right. Any other comments? Good. Well, Joe, thank you so much. A for pleasure. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Eric. Everybody?